What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell, and in today's video we cover a classic Pontiani opening game played by none other than Magnus Carlsen as he went up against Pantala Hare Krishna back in 2013. And if you haven't heard of the Pontiani opening before, it's an underrated chess opening system for white in which we play the move E4 and as a response against E5, in which case we play knight F3. But against knight C6, we're not gonna go with one of the main options here, or bishop C4 with the Italian game, Sasuke Copiano, bishop B5 with Ori Lopez, or even the Scotch game with D4. But instead, this move C3, and there's a good chance you probably haven't seen this move played very often. It's very rare, and I'm honestly not sure why. This is a top-notch system for white with a ton of chess opening traps, which can help you beat higher-rated players and also just gets you some very quick and easy wins. Against this move C3, there's a ton of theory here, but we see black continue with knight f6, and now Carlsen continuing with the best move of d4. I mean, just expanding in the center of the board, and now black continuing with d4. Five. Here, Black trying to put as much tension right in the center of the board as they possibly can. And now as White, we do have quite a few different options. I mean, we could take on D5 with the pawn. We can take on E5 with either our pawn on D4 or the knight on F3. But my personal recommendation and the move which Carlson played is not taking either of these pawns, but playing Bishop B5, pinning this knight on C6 to the king on E8. And here, Black can get into trouble very quickly if they're not careful. However, obviously, Carlson is going up against Patella Hare Krishna, a very strong GM. He knows what he's doing. So we see this move E takes D4. And now the main line from white E5, kicking this knight to E4. And now knight takes D4. Notice here we have two minor pieces attacking this knight on C6. So we see black defend it with the move bishop D7. And now Carlson taking on C6 and then castling kingside. And let's evaluate this position very quickly. What did we get and what did we give up? by taking this knight on c6. Well, first off, we gave up the bishop hair. That is one advantage that you could argue that black has here. Black has the bishop hair. We don't. The plus side of taking on c6 is that black's pawn structure is extremely bad, particularly on the top left section of the board. I mean, here we have an isolated pawn on a7, double pawns on the c-file, and this pawn on d5. Black's pawn structure is in shambles over here, and in return, they got the bishop here. On top of that, we have this pawn on e5, which is a very nice advanced pawn, really making things hard for black here in terms of developing their pieces and coordinating them. We see black play this move bishop e7. Obviously, a move like bishop d6 is not possible because of that pawn on e5. And now from Carlson, just natural developmental chess, bishop e3, and against castling kingside, knight d2. Now, really in this position, guys, again, black's pawn structure is not very good. I think that black needs to play a move like c5, attacking our knight, or take on d2 and then play c5. Just try to create some kind of counterplay here and try to break open this position as they do have a bishop pair on d7, e7. But here we see this move knight c5 from black, which I don't think is the best option because now Carlson can play b4 attacking this knight. And this knight does have technically a lot of different options in terms of where it can move, but black settles on this move of knight b7. And guys, talk about a very awkwardly placed knight, right? I mean, this knight was on e4, very active. Black could have traded it right off for this knight on d2, but now black is stuck with a knight on b7, which can barely even move. In fact, it can't move without simply getting captured. And here we see Carlson continue with f4, expanding on the king side of the board. I mean, this is the type of position that you want to get out of the Ponziani opening, f4 with f5 ideas on the way, really trying to create a presence on the king side. And here black tries to distract Carlson by playing the move a5 attacking on the queen side. And Carlson here could have played a move like a3. And there's not like there's anything wrong with the move a3. I mean, here Carlson just plays a3, defending that pawn on b4. White's going to be completely okay. But here Carlson continues to march forward with f5. Not really worried about losing the pawn on b4. And here Black simply wins the pawn by capturing and yet capturing again. But now we see Carlson play this move queen g4. And again, guys, talk about a presence on the king side of the board. I mean, these pawns on e5 and f5 are absolutely dominating this game. We have an active queen on g4 putting pressure on that g7 pawn. And right now, we have ideas such as bishop h6. Notice, by the way, f6 looks good because it's attacking that pawn on g7. But the moment we play f6, we're simply going to lose our queen. So right now, our real only threat 
is playing this move bishop h6. Again, this pawn is pinned to the bishop. So here by playing that move, we're actually going to be threatening a mate in one. Here black plays the move bishop c3. A very nice find, but some of you may be wondering, okay, why didn't black just play the move king h8? This seems like the most logical option. And oftentimes in chess, if your g or b pawn is pinned to the king with bishop h6 ideas in the air, you usually just move the king one step over because obviously now bishop h6 no longer works because we simply lose our minor piece. However, black did not play this because of the very nice find knight e6. Absolutely crushing move for white, attacking the queen and attacking the rook. Now we're gonna cover the move f takes e6, but let's first cover what happens if bishop takes e6 is played. In this case, we're not gonna take back on e6, but we're actually gonna take this bishop on b4, sliding our queen out of nowhere to the queen side of the board, attacking both the bishop and the knight on b7. And if black tries to hang on to both with a move like bishop c8, we're currently down a pawn, but that's okay. We're gonna play this move f6, advancing on the king side of the board, putting pressure on g7. And here, guys, I mean, if a move like g6 is played, we're gonna swing our queen right back to h4. We have queen h6 and queen g7 ideas in the air. And on top of that, knight f3 and knight g5 ideas on the way, putting pressure on h7. Guys, this position is nearly lost for black. So y'all, this move knight e6, which attacks the queen, a rook, and threatens mate in one. And on top of that, this bishop on b4 is a very strong option. What happens if black just takes with the f pawn? Well, guys, in this case, we could take on b4, but I think even stronger than this is playing the move f6, continuing to put pressure on the king side of the board. In fact, right now we're threatening a mate in one on g7. And once black takes the pawn, on f6, we're simply gonna take that bishop right off, attacking this knight on b7. And I mean, look, here black could take on e5, in which case, yeah, we're just gonna win that knight. And in that case, we're up a piece, but we're also down four pawns. However, white is still much, much better. Black does have four pawns for a piece, which is a lot, but at the same time, this king is very vulnerable to attack, and these pawns are gonna start coming off like candy once we start making them targets. What about a move like rook b8, just trying to hold on to the knight? Well, in this case, again, we're just going to swing our queen all the way back to h4, like in that previous variation. And notice how much pressure we're currently putting on this pawn on f6. And notice how black cannot even take the pawn on e5 because of bishop g5, forming a battery ram against that queen. And the moment that this queen moves out of the way, we have bishop f6 with check the rook lift, bringing this rook up to the third rank, rook g3 on the way. And y'all, this game is nearly over. So going back to this key position, Carlson gave up a pawn on the queen side of the board. But as you can see, black has some pretty serious issues that they got to work through right now. And black has to be extremely careful. King h8 simply runs into knight e6 and white is crushing that game. Now, as I mentioned before, black played this move bishop c3, in which case Carlson continues by rook a c1. Some of you may be wondering, OK, wait, against bishop c3, why did Carlson play the move? rook c1. Why not bishop h6 simply threatening a mate in one? Well, guys, in this position, the whole purpose of bishop c3 is actually not to take on a1, but to take on d4 with check. Notice, by the way, if our queen takes, we're simply going to lose our bishop on h6 and our attack is fizzling out. And if our king moves over, trying to maintain the threat of checkmate in one, we see bishop c3, bishop d4, and now bishop takes e5, really defending that pawn on g7. Again, f6 is not possible because we'd simply lose our queen. And guys, this position is now resignable for white. So again, y'all, bishop h6 simply does not work because if bishop takes d4 check, followed by bishop takes e5. So here we see the move rook a c1 instead from Carlson, which simply attacks the bishop. And on top of that, tries to really activate this rook for the rest of the game, putting pressure on both of these very weak c pawns on c6 and c7. Here from black, we see the move bishop takes d4. And after the trade-off, rook takes a two block, trying to activate their major piece on that a file, attacking that knight on d2. And guys, in this position, we see from Carlson the move e6, a very nice find. At first sight, it's like, wait, why doesn't black just take the knight on d2, win a piece, and after a pawn takes d7, simply get that pawn back. Well, guys, the purpose behind e6 is actually not to attack this bishop, although that is included. The main threat is to actually threaten a mate in one 
on g7. So black has to stop this by playing the move f6. And now, guys, Carlson makes a very interesting decision, and that is playing the move knight b3. Guys, Carlson could have taken this bishop, winning a piece, and then losing a piece the move after. It seems like an even trade. However, notice that this pawn on d7 would have been picked off. And on top of that, we in chess have to ask ourselves when and when not to trade. Here, Carlson decides not to trade that bishop on d7 for the knight on d2. And it really makes a ton of sense. We see this move knight b3 holding on to our knight. And notice now black has to make the choice. Okay, do I lose a piece on d7? Or do I bring this bishop back to e8, which by the way is what was played in the game, and have an absolutely terrible bishop? So now looking back, as you guys can see, Carlson could have got rid of this knight for this bishop and also lost this pawn on e6, but now we have a very strong knight on b3 ready to jump into c5. And guys, notice how this bishop on e8 can't really even move without simply getting captured. It's a tall pawn and it's simply a terrible piece for black. So it makes a ton of sense for Carlson to keep the tension on the board and get an active knight on b3 opposed to trading it on e8. In fact, the very next move, Carlson plays knight c5, jumping into the c5 square. And here, black could have taken on c5, but then we play bishop takes c5, which, by the way, traps the rook on f8. Notice here how this bishop isn't only making the bishop not active, but also this rook on f8. In fact, right now, this bishop cannot move without getting captured, and this rook cannot move without getting captured. So knight takes c5. Bishop takes c5. We're simply going to win the exchange. Here, black plays the move knight d6, trying to hold on to this rook on f8. And in this case, we simply see queen f3 from Carlson. Here, Carlson is not in a rush, just bringing this queen back, giving it a little bit more scope and vision. And against the move queen e7, again, guys, let's evaluate this position. Let's try to figure out what pieces to trade and what pieces not to trade. First off, let's evaluate white's position and each of white's pieces. First off, we have a very strong supported pass pawn all the way down on e6, which is making things very difficult for black. It's supported by this pawn on f5 and this strong knight on c5, which, by the way, is supported by this active and centralized bishop on d4. Our queen on f3 is a solid piece. Our rook on c1 is well placed, and our rook on f1 is also a solid piece. Here on the black side of things, again, this bishop on e8 cannot move without getting captured. This rook cannot move without getting captured. This queen can only go to the d8 square, which by the way, it was just at. And this knight is not a terrible piece, but at the same time, it's not really making any kind of threats right now. The one active piece that black does have is this rook on a2. So why not try to get rid of black's good piece? We see this move rook f2. Now guys, if I walked up to you guys and I said, look, you can give up your rook on f1 for the rook on f8. I will simply take both of the rooks off the board. We wouldn't want this as white because our rook on f1 is much better than this rook on f8. However, what if I told you, look, I'm gonna come by and I'm simply gonna get rid of this rook on a2 and the rook on f1, that is a much better deal because yet again, this is an active piece. So here Carlson, long story short, offers up the rook, a somewhat okay rook for this very active rook on a2. Here black declines the trade by playing rook a5, but now we have knight b3 and bishop c5 from Carlson, making it so that the knight on d6 cannot even move as well because it's currently pinned to the queen on e7. And now from black, we see the desperation play of bishop h5. The only reason that this move works currently is because of this rook b5 idea. If we take this bishop, we're simply going to lose our knight. So here Carlson opts to keep pieces on the board by playing queen c3. And after the move, queen e8, simply bringing this queen back to e3, guys, in a position like this with a supported pass pawn on e6 and active pieces all over the place, there's really no rush to try to find a win in two to five moves. Let's just slowly improve the positioning of our pieces and see what opens up. Here, black plays queen a8, and now from white, knight d4 attacking the rook. Now, I think most players here would have played the move rook a5. This is not what was played in the game. What would have Carlson done? if a move like rook a5 was played. Well, my guess is that Carlson would have taken this knight on g6 and then played knight takes c6. Here, white is down a pawn. We're still down a little bit of material, but we're more than okay. I mean, we're attacking this rook on a5. If black tries to play active chess with rook a3, we're okay with that. We're going to play queen f4, attacking this pawn on g6. I mean, these double isolated pawns in the center of the board are extremely weak. As always, this pawn on e6 is very well placed with e7 ideas in the air every single move. And here the computer gives about a plus one advantage for white. 
So y'all, black decides not to play this move, rook a5, in which case we could take on d6, take on c6, continue with a move like queen f4, pick off these pawns, and we're simply going to have a better game. Here instead, we see this move, rook takes c5. Some may wonder, at least when I first saw this game, I was going, what on earth is black trying to do here? Simply giving up the exchange. But now black plays knight e4, attacking both of our rooks, and there's simply no way for Carlson to save both. However, what Carlson could do, which he did, is take this pawn on c6, get something back and against knight takes f2 capturing back with the king here we see queen a2 check from black and now king g3 from carlson now black plays rook e8 this isn't technically the best move but i think from a practical standpoint black was just worried about every single move having to worry about e7 ideas attacking that rook why not just get this rook over to e8 stop the pain of potential e7 ideas attacking that rook with tempo and just try to improve black's position slowly but slowly here from carlson again we're not in a rush let's just play the move h3 making it so that our king can always run to h2 if needed and now after the move queen a6 we see queen c3 from carlson guys in positions like this notice how black's pieces aren't really coordinated and they can't really do a whole ton on the opposite end of things our pieces on the c file are very solid and we don't need to worry about checkmating this king in the next two to five moves we can simply continue to slowly improve the positioning of our pieces trying to create water from a stone quote unquote just as carlson does very well in plenty of his games here from black we see bishop e2 just trying to muster up some kind of counterplay potentially bishop c4 defending that pawn on d5 but here carlson just snatches off that centralized pawn and now playing the move bishop b5 attacking our knight we see knight b4 from carlson attacking the queen and following queen b7 Carlson now continues with queen c5, attacking that bishop on b5. And after the bishop runs away, we see the brilliant move rook d7. I mean, this is a Magnus Carlson type find, attacking this pawn on c7 and attacking the pawn on g7. The big question here is, okay, what happens if black takes on d7? Well, now black's completely losing because we're going to take back with the e pawn. And notice here, if this rook wants to run away to a square like e4, we're simply going to make a queen. And if a move like rook d8, we're now going to play queen e7, attacking this rook. Look, again, if this rook wants to run away, we're simply going to promote. And if a move like queen a8 is played, we can now play knight c6, double attacking this rook on d8. And the moment that the queen leaves by taking the knight on c6, we simply win the rook. And a move later, we have ourselves a game over. So y'all, against this move, rook d7, Hare Krishna did not take on d7 because of that e takes d7 idea, but instead goes with queen e4, trying to somehow create some activity here. But notice how Carlson has his bases very well covered. In fact, right now, this queen really has no checks, which are currently not covered by the white pieces, right? I mean, this queen on c5 is holding things together. And by the way, if we see a move like queen e5, we can simply take off that queen and we're going to have a very easy win end game. So Carlson really isn't worried right now about checks and instead just snatches off the pawn on c7 again. If you want to play queen e5, we'll trade off and I'll have a one end game. So here from black, we see h5 potentially trying to play h4 check. Carlson goes, you know what? I'm good. I don't want that h4 check to happen. I'm going to play king h2, bring my king back. And now black plays this move, king h7. Some of you may be wondering, and for good reason, why didn't black just check on f4? Well, against this, white can now play king g1. And yet again, black is not going to have any checks. So we see this move, king h7. And now from Carlson, queen f2. Another very nice find. The big idea here is that if black decides to take our knight on b4, which by the way, we just kind of handed over to black, we now have this idea of queen g3 attacking the pawn on g7 notice by the way i mean if i move like rook g8 we have queen g6 check queen takes h5 game over and if rook e7 again queen g6 check and now bringing our rook to that back rank rook c8 black has no choice but to start giving up material we're going to take on e8 we're going to get our material back and even get some more by taking on h5 and if this king goes back i mean there's plenty of ways for white to win i mean even if we move like queen e2 just dropping this queen back we have four pawns and a queen against two pawns and a queen. And there's no doubt in my mind that Carlson would have went on to turn this into a win. So guys, against this move queen f2, black decided not to take the knight because of that very strong queen g3 idea and instead 
plays this move rook g8. And now, guys, queen g3 no longer works. I mean, it does threaten queen g6 check, followed by queen takes h5. But now if we play queen g3, this queen is no longer on b4, but it's still on e4. I mean, if we play queen g3, queen takes f5 is played, and black is simply okay there. So here we see the move knight a6 saving the minor piece. And against the move rook e8, bringing this rook back to c5, black plays queen d3, in which case Carlson continues with knight before attacking the queen. And here black finally gets a couple of checks in, but after queen g1, again, we are simply okay here. I mean, if black wants to take on g1, we're going to take back with the king. We're going to be up a pawn with a supported pass pawn on e6. Here black decides to bring that queen all the way back to d6, in which case we centralize our knight on d5. Notice how all of white's pieces defend each other. Rook f8 is played, and now queen d4 from Carlson centralizing his queen. And against king h8, we see rook c8. I mean, just activating this rook. If you look at some of the last moves that black has played, I mean, moves like bishop e8, king h8, etc. Some of you may be wondering, okay, what on earth is black trying to do? Why aren't they trying to play for the win or trying to create some kind of activity? Well, guys, there's really not much that black could do besides just kind of move back and forth. And in the meantime, Carlson has very slowly but surely improved the positioning of his pieces here. Black plays the move bishop c6, and it appears as if after this move, black simply resigned the game because there's so many different ways for white to win. I mean, here white could have played moves like rook takes f8, rook takes c6, followed by queen d1 attacking the pawn on h5. There's a lot of different ways to go. I think the prettiest way to get a decisive result would have been knight takes f6. Whole idea being, look, I mean, if you want to take our knight on f6, we're simply going to win your queen on d6 if your queen runs away to a square like e7 okay we take on f8 and we snatch off another pawn on h5 we're about to be three pawns up in that position and obviously the big question here okay if queen takes d4 is played we now have a mate in one because we're attacking that king and the h7 square is not available this would have been a game over thanks for watching today's video if you'd like to learn the theory behind the Ponziani opening, click that video to the left. If you'd like to learn the theory behind the perk defense for black, click that video to the right. Leave a comment down below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.